So again, the theme was from the mountain, and it's uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew, and it starts at chapter 5. And I just want to highlight the beginning of uh, this wonderful sermon. Real, I'm just going to break through uh, some of these passages real quick and uh, just kind of highlight some of what God was teaching uh, not only those that were gathered on the mountain over 2,000 years ago, but those that were gathered in Kansas City a couple weeks ago. Um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mountain. One of the hardest things in life is admitting sometimes that you need help. Um, admitting you need help. And the main reason for this is our pride or our self-centeredness will not readily allow us to seek help from external sources. So we try things like faking it until we make it, or the false social concept of trying to live our truth, whatever that really means, or do what makes you happy. Unfortunately for us, oftentimes the making it, um, our truth, whatever that might be, or doing what makes us happy in the moment never fully turns out well for us in the long run. And we fall short and into further hurt and heartbreak. The serpent in the garden tricked Eve by falsely having her believe that she and Adam could have it all. By pushing that narrative of self-centeredness. Live your truth life. And by telling her that they could be like God with their eyes opened. That they could be the center of their story. And that they would need no help from or reliance on the creator anymore that they were sufficient apart from god which of course is satan's goal for all of us in this room and outside these walls so with that as the backdrop let's take a quick look at the beatitudes that jesus preached at the start of the sermon on the mount this might look and sound like a weird way to start a sermon the way he starts it But right from the rip, Jesus is going to be turning societal norms and standard human thought on its head with great intention as he sets the stage for the remainder of his sermon and beyond that, his ministry. So let's take a look. This is uh, Matthew 5, 1 through 11. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he starts out, blessed are the poor in spirit. A person who is poor in spirit knows that their spirit is weak and insufficient, especially when it comes to salvation and their righteousness with God. This person knows that this need is met in the Lord and that the work of the Holy Spirit is fully sufficient. We are told that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God meets us in the now and the not yet. We are redeemed through salvation in Jesus now and given a new spirit that comes with a blessed assurance of eternal treasure in the not yet. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourning means to feel deep sorrow, to show great concern, or to deplore something existing, some existing wrong. It applies that 
we are to live a life with a hi- that if we are to live a life with a higher calling that is bigger than ourselves then we are to be sensitive sympathetic tender hearted and alert to the needs of others but also be aware of our own sin and lack of obedience in the lord it's not simply about others doing and doing good works As we accept the gift of salvation, we must die to ourselves in order to live for Christ. And it is out of that redeemed life that we are able to love God and love others well. Jesus did not imply that mourning is about those who might have a morbid view of life. You know, those who see the negatives first and think the worst always. He was speaking to people who were seeking to live fuller lives with God at the center Jesus tells that if we die to ourselves, which does come with some mourning, because sometimes living for ourselves is fun in the moment, if we die to ourselves and begin to live for him, we will be comforted. This is where we are able to find joy in the sorrow. Blessed are the meek. Meekness begins when we put our trust in God. Then because we trust him, we commit our way to him. We roll onto him our anxieties, frustrations, our plans, our relationships, our jobs, and our health, and our households. And then we patiently and prayerfully wait for the Lord. We trust his timing and his power and his grace to work things out in the best way for his glory and for our good. Meekness begins with God and ends with God. And in that, the promise is that the meek will inherit the earth. As heirs of his kingdom, the Lord will give us strength, the Holy Spirit of the Creator, to endure in meekness when the natural inclination would be to defend ourselves, to retaliate, or to give way to hurtful anger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst in a physical sense is a sign of life. I mean, if we are dead, we would not crave amazing food like fajitas and nachos and tacos and queso. Maybe that's just me that craves those things. Or have a desire to drink an ice-cold Dr. Pepper. Now, the Bible teaches that our soul must feed on the things of God, otherwise our heart will become hardened and our stubbornness will grow. Acts 28, 27 quotes Isaiah the prophet, saying, For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their, eye, with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed. If we starve our soul from the things of God, we run the risk of losing all desire for God. And when that happens, we face not only a physical death, but an eternal spiritual death. Therefore, we must hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God. And it is through salvation, through that dying to ourselves and being filled by the Spirit and the study of God's Word and worship and devotion and prayer and service in His name that we remain close to God. We are told that in a right relationship, in righteousness with God, our hunger and thirst is satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. Mercy is defined as compassion or forgiveness shown towards somebody who is within who it's within one's power to harm or punish. For example, a judge of law might show mercy to a criminal offender by granting a more lenient punishment, such as community service hours and counseling instead of prison time. Some might read the Beatitudes and think that if we show This kind of mercy to others, we we should expect mercy in return. And that could be partially true, I guess, but in context with the rest of the teachings, I think the point is the fact that we have a God that has shown us great mercy in Jesus, our Savior, Messiah, by offering us eternal life and everlasting relationship with God, even when... Because of our sin nature, we deserve eternal death and separation 
from our loving God. It's from the overflow of God's mercy to us that we are able to live in a merciful way to others. Apart from God and living by cultural norms, we are to show no, no mercy. It's survival of the fittest. Mercy truly comes again once we die to ourselves and follow Christ. That is where we find mercy and through by which we can offer mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. The heart is more than a bodily organ. The heart has been called the seat of our emotions. Love, courage, fear, anger, sorrow, hatred, jealousy, pride, and many more are found at the heart of a person. This is why when Jesus comes into our heart, he becomes the center of our emotions. Therefore, our love toward God must be pure. The motives of our heart must be pure and centered on Christ. Pure gold is not mixed with other metals. Pure milk is not watered down. When we are pure in heart, we must have a single-minded devotion to God so that our minds will not be mixed with the things of this world that are not right. It is natural for us to to work from an outside-in mentality when trying to look like we have things figured out to an outsider. But to really be pure in heart, we must work from the inside out as we let God transform us and make us to be more of who he's creating us to be. This is how we can have a pure heart and see God in our life. Blessed are the peacemakers. Like being pure in heart, true peace can only be experienced once we have actually been reconciled to God. To be a peacemaker, we have to possess true peace with God. By the cross, Christ has made peace with God for us and is himself our peace. When Christ enters our heart, we are freed from sin to experience the peace of God. It is from that grace we can begin to act as peacemakers within a culture that shows little personal, domestic, social, economic, or political peace anywhere. As reconciled peace ambassadors for God, we live into our calling as sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The first part of the Beatitudes describe our life as God meets us, meets our needs with grace, mercy, and love through the blessing that is salvation in Jesus. As a result of the righteousness that we gain now through our Savior, we are told to persevere the persecution that we will face for righteousness' sake. That is, as we begin to live out these blessings through our new life in Christ, we will experience persecution. For example, as we begin to live a Christian life of self-control, humility, and respect for God's design for sexuality, to name a few characteristics, we will be seen as an attack on people's love for drunkenness, excess, and sexuality. We will be seen as intolerant and unloving by a hurting community that doesn't yet even know why they are hurting. And Jesus says that it is okay. I am with you. You see, Jesus doesn't just leave it there for us to deal with. He says that you will experience all this in my name. Meaning, I am not expecting you, Jesus saying, I'm not expecting you to experience anything more than I have experienced. I have experienced everything that you will experience and more. Jesus experienced because of you and because of me and for you, and for me, as well as all those outside these walls. And he teaches that because of the blessed blessing that is a new life in him, we can and should rejoice in the face of persecution, for the reward is great in heaven. One of the speakers used the term beloved, and it struck a chord with all of us, so beloved, we know that life can be crazy. Pain is real. Hurt people hurt people. The worldly culture today is not 
in lockstep with God's will for our life, nor was it over 2,000 years ago when Jesus was speaking this message. Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount by flipping these realities on their head and is calling us to do the same. So I, there's a slide that's going to be up here in just a second. I want us to take a look at this slide here. On the left, we got the things Jesus said. Jesus said, poor in spirit. And to that, culture often says, fake it till you make it, and pride above all else. Jesus says, mourn, and those that are in mourning. Culture says, get over it. Get over it and move on. Jesus says, we are to be meek. Culture says, hustle, get yours. You're more important. Jesus says to, to have righteousness with God. Culture says cheat, lie, and steal to get what you want. To be merciful is what Jesus says, and to fight and have no mercy is what culture says. Jesus says be pure in heart. Culture says do what you want, live your truth. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers. Culture says to expose everything and gossip. Boy, is there a lot of gossip on social media. Jesus says, you will be persecuted. And culture says, if you're persecuted, you're weak. As we read and study the Beatitudes, we come to understand that blessing, like somebody said, doesn't come from our circumstances. Our yesterday doesn't get to define our tomorrow when it comes to a new life in Jesus. Jesus wants you, me, and all with ears to hear to know this. We are blessed because of who he is. It is thanks to Jesus we are met and blessed in the here and now through salvation and met in the not yet as we look forward to the blessed promise of a great reward in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we just give you thanks for um, opportunities like challenge. We give you thanks um, for opportunities to worship in places like Arthur Evangelical Free Church here in Arthur, Iowa. We give you thanks for the work that you're doing within the church and through the church. And God, we just ask that you help us to um, fully, fully commit to trying to learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus amidst a culture that is often hostile to your ways. Help us to understand your Sermon on the Mount and that it starts with a call, a call to live a life for you, a call to die to ourselves. And that in that call, there is this new life through salvation that we're given and we're told that we will not only have life but have it abundantly with you, God. So thank you for being our God, the creator of all things. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior, Messiah. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells within and transforms us from the inside out, helping us to put, us, put you at the center of our heart. God, we thank you. And we lift your name up in prayer. Amen. That's all.